Well, welcome and good afternoon. Uh, it is Monday, June 17th, and it's uh, 3.30 p.m. Uh, this is the uh, uh, work session of the Port of Olympia Commission, and um, I'm officially calling this work session to order and would just like to uh, uh, welcome our, our guests, the uh, Port of Olympia Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, nice to have the nice to have the whole group here together today. Um, so we do have an agenda in front of us. Uh, do we have a, a motion to approve today's agenda? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for today. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Um, all in favor of approving today's agenda, uh, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you. We have an agenda. Uh, one quick announcement. Uh, uh, Commissioner Harding uh, will not be joining us today. She has an excused absence. Um, the uh, first item on our agenda is uh, Port of Olympia Citizens Advisory Committee Work Product and Discussion. Um, Camille, are you starting us off or? Actually, executive yeah, I director. guess too. Executive Director. Start it all off just to say uh, we're excited to have the POCAC come and meet directly with you all today. They've got some work products that they have put together for some of their subcommittees that they really wanted to share with you. And then we also wanted to have the opportunity for you all to have a discussion about how they can help you and what you would really appreciate from them in their role as the Citizens Advisory Committee. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Camille. Or do I turn it over to Joel? Joel and Don. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to quickly turn it over to the subcommittee, but um, thanks for having us. We're happy to be here, excited to um, share some of the work that, that the POCAC has been doing and then have a discussion about the work that we can be doing to support the commission and staff moving forward. There's a lot of opportunity and we're excited to, to have a dialogue about that. Um, so I will turn it over to Bob. But he's the chair of the subcommittee that's been working on destination waterfront. That's um, I think the the one active uh, assignment that we have from the commission, um, and just uh, they've done a lot of great work, and I'm I'm excited to for you to to hear about it. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity for us to share with you today. We've been working for about eight months. Before we get into the substance, I want to introduce the people who have been involved. So Joel, who you just met, Deb, Quentin, Sue, Darlene. Did I get yeah, her? And Jim. And Jim. And Jim. Jim. Sorry, I'm here. All right, there we go. And this is our wonderful picture that you see up there. So what we want to do is we got four parts. The first is a little background on where we came from, what happened before. The second is our recommendations. Third is to show you some of the exciting work that's been happening in other ports that you may or may not know about. And then lastly, and most importantly, we're hoping to have a conversation with all of you about your thoughts, how we might move forward, things you liked and things that perhaps you did not like. So with that, the first Genesis of this one, it goes quite a ways back, but in the recent iteration was Vision 2050, which I think you've all heard about. It was completed in 2019. It had about four different sections. One of the sections dealt with destination waterfront and the boat works. And the action plan items you see out of that was for marina and boat works add amenities and access to the water along the peninsula and, connect, and build connections between swan town and core downtown when it came to destination waterfront it recommended doing a task force to develop recommendations so that task force was created and out of it came a destination water development vision this says it was completed in 2023, but there were some different iterations, different PowerPoints. The first one that I could see was in 2021, where the full plan was presented to the commission. It dealt with 
fair number of different things. The major piece was looking at a development plan for different sections, but it was very general. It provided a good sort of, here's the regulatory framework. The only two recommendations that were actually in it was the RV park, which perhaps you've heard about, and that was not accepted by the city of Olympia. And the second was the administrative building. Other than that, there were really no solid recommendations in it. So the planning area, the bottom left is the North Point area, and it spanned all the way down to the South, um, down near the, the Children's Museum. It was broken up into different components, and each component, each section, had recommendations, had the restrictions, and had, here's some possibilities. So this is very difficult for you to read. I'm going to even take my glasses so I can read what's there. Let me highlight a couple of things. So this is question seven, and it was what opportunities would benefit the community. So there was a large public outreach effort. And on this particular question, the one with the biggest line off on the left was public access and amenities. The second is education, the museum. The third is small local businesses, arts and entertainment, sailing center, and then move down from there. Question five, which we found relevant to the work that we're doing, was where, what ways can we provide public access to the water? And the way this one is structured, here, here we go. On the far right, the largest one is a small boat resources. They extend the walking trail. And the next one is public access parks and green space, beaches and public spaces. So that's what the group heard from the public. This slide summarizes the outcome statement of the major planning effort. And it talks about restaurants, recreation, public art, visitor accommodations, inviting and walkable. They talk about one anchor hospitality tenant, court business and administrative offices, public amenities, and view preservation. So, so that basically summarizes the destination waterfront planning effort and the outcomes that they would like to see. <clears throat> so about six months ago, the Citizen Advisory Committee created a subcommittee on destination waterfront. And our charge was working with you all, working with port staff, come up with recreational water access, tourist facilities, and other uses that are potentially viable. That was our, something that could be done. So when you look at when was Vision 2050 done, where are we today? It's five years. And some of us, I don't know about you all, but impatient, like to see things done. We want action, even if it's small action. And so, created this bottom line is what low cost interim steps could be taken to show the public that the port is moving forward in providing additional amenities, additional access, moving forward with destination waterfront. And so those are our potentially viable actions. I'm gonna now turn it over to Sue and hit this button. And we're gonna come up with, here's our three potentially viable options. I get to do the button, huh? Which one? Okay. Okay. So the first, uh, the first potentially viable action was uh, building my junior trail, making sure that it was enhanced, safe, and um, accessible. And um, then we were looking at developing partnerships with the City of Olympia and watercraft groups. Well, how can we provide more public access for people and their boats? And that would include kayaks, canoes, um, any kind of, uh, of uh, watercraft. 
And then the third was the uh, finalization of the Billy Frank Jr. Park, which is at the north end of the Billy Frank Jr. Trail. And um, the North Point Community, some kind of North Point Community Event Center. If you go down there now, you know you can park at the North Point where the cap is on um, Cascade Pole site and walk down to the end of the trail and out to North Point to uh, the Billy Frank Jr. Um, park. So the Billy Frank Jr. Trail Enhancement the objective was to improve and enhance the Billy Frank Jr. Trail that originates at the south end of the planning area and ends at the north um, Billy Frank Jr. Park area. Um, it says port staff are installing Billy Frank Jr. kiosk and signs, but they have been installed. And if you walk down there, you'll be taken back by how beautiful they are. It's just an amazing area. The, the signs are um, I think there's about eight panels, six or eight panels, and they're very descriptive of Billy's place in um, tribal uh, culture here in South Sound. And it talks a lot about the, his, his struggles trying to get the uh, up to the bolt decision. And um, when I was down there, it brought tears to my eyes because I've been involved so much with uh, the Fox and Tribe, their, um, their ongoing cultural um, access to this area. <clears throat> um, the north end of the trail, though, itself, the, the Billy Frank Jr. Park, is not necessarily connected to the park. Yet you go out and park at North Point and then walk down and get on the trail. The surface is uneven, uneven in places, and it, it's probably not ADA accessible at this point. Um, directional information and signage is lacking down there. We need to be a little more, we need, we need to make the trail more aware of people and how to get down there from the very beginning of the trail to the end. Um, we would like to uh, suggest that we improve signage, landscaping, and connect it to the parking lot on the beach end and improve ADA accessibility. So um, I don't know if you can see this line, but the lines starting here, all along the waterfront out to North Point is where the Billy Frank Jr. Trail is. That, that's the location of the trail. Um, the north section again ends at Billy Frank Jr. Park. And here are some pictures of, uh -oh. Oh, um, of the trail along the way. There, there's a need for landscaping on the water side. And, and today I was out there this morning and they were mowing the, the grass on the left side. And I was thinking to myself, there were flowers growing and stuff and they were all getting mowed. And I thought, no. <laughs> Because it was, it was already the the grass is already dead for this for the summer, and it was being mowed, and it just seemed like kind of overkill. But um, and then on the the far right, you'll see the end of the trail, at where the round it kind of loops around, and there is a fence um, that is put up to keep people from walking into the private area where KGY is. And then right on that um, board on the gravel, there's some rebar sticking up, which is um, Neil's working with staff, maintenance staff to get that taken out because it's a, a tripping hazard. So I think at this point, yeah. So the second recommendation is the city of Olympia and community groups to create more access for small watercraft. And there's a short-term possibilities and then there's the long-term. The long-term is a nice sailing center out a little south of Hearthfire. Um, it would be a great location, but it's after dredging, it's after fill. It's, I don't know if I'm gonna be alive by then, but it's far away. 
And that would be fabulous. It would be a destination lots of people would come to. The nearer term solution is to look at some on dock boat storage. The port has put in some a new paddleboard stand. If you walk down the guest dock, there's a place also for kayak storage. But that area right down where Orr is could be a place where people could come to and have access to their own or others' boats, similar to what we have with Orr. And as you know, Orr is pretty incredible. Probably the next important step that needs to be made is maybe hire a new waterfront director. You know, the TJ is gone and then work with the Olympia Community Sailing, Port of Olympia, and see what short-term solutions might be possible in the, the guest storage area as it comes to this. So with that, I think I turn it over to Clinton. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, the area I'm, I'm going to uh, speak on is specifically um, Clark, Blue Frank Clark, and the cap, the lower cap that exists out there. And as, we, as you use personal landing as, as an example, that's a possible example of how we can improve that specific area, which has got quite a bit of space to it. Uh, the area has spectacular views, as you probably well aware, but we'll show you some of those. Um, and that area is really, um, you know, it's, it's a functional park and trail, but it could be enhanced. I think uh, Sue mentioned ADA accessibility would be an example. Possible bathroom down there where people come to visit the first thing they ask for is the bathroom. So those are some things that we've been thinking about. Um, now we don't have all the expertise to figure these things out. Um, so um, what we would recommend is to hire a landscape architect for a small dollar amount in the budget, hopefully this year and work through and discern what options may actually exist for the cap and, and for the par. Now, we have some ideas of what we would might recommend. Uh, that again, you know, we're trying to provide public access, right? For the entire public. So those who, who will want to make sure that they had access to that, that area. Um, you know, additional landscaping would be helpful out there. There's no trees or anything really at that park in there. Um, so we think that, you know, maybe partnering with community, uh, nonprofits here in town, city, you know, we can learn a little bit more about what our options are and what can be done. Uh, because some of these local community groups have a lot of knowledge about you know, plants, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we want to figure out a way to connect the trail to a designated parking area. Right now there's hearth fire, right? And there's a bunch of space there that's, that's really kind of not uh, designated as parking. So we want to figure out a way for people who want to park there to formally park there. And if, if they're disabled, maybe they would have a disabled park, park basis. Uh, so those are some of the things we've been thinking about. You know, pick, it, 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 children play structures, encourage families to come down there, try to figure out a way to promote the area. And enhancing it is one way to do that. So the next slide. I think we're all familiar with what we're talking about, but essentially we're talking about site A here, which is about two and a half acres. Lose the cap in the park. Okay, this is what it looks like now. Like I said it's functional, right? We have a functional trail, but is it is is that what you want to leave it as? It can it be enhanced and to you know to encourage people to come down there. I believe it can be, and it can be beautified and made a great made as a great destination. So the next slide is some of the good news. There is something you don't have to pay for. They're already down there. There are resources there that are available to everyone. Uh, there's wildlife there uh, in in a in a lot of different types. There's uh, harbor seals, terns. There's just a, a variety of wildlife down there that you don't have to pay to see. They're just there, you have to go out and look for them. And all through the year, these, these animals come and go. Uh, they're partners with you, whether you like it or not. And they're out there and they're there for our enjoyment. Um, the otter was on the, uh, the river otter was on the hearth fire dock 
uh, and I think you all probably are familiar with the cormorants in the area. Uh, they move in and out of that space to Winter Park, Winter Park. Um, probably 800 nesting pairs in the year. The top left slide is uh, your partnership with the harbor seals are right by your dock. Uh, you can go out there and see them just about any day. Uh, the people come out there and count them. I don't know who they are, but there's there's, there's a times over 150 harbor seals in that area. Uh, and you also have uh, down on the bottom there, you, you're, you're uh, the ospreys that come and nest down by the hawk pond every year. And a couple of years ago, they were very successful. They had uh, th uh, three fledglings that came out of that nest. So, I mean, the, the ability of the, the port to coexist with wildlife and nature is just it demonstrated by this. And if we can encourage people to, to support that, I think that would help, help, uh, help the port, help us as a community. So, not, uh, can you play that uh, slide? Uh, play that first video. I'm playing your video or the Bellingham? Mine. Fingers crossed. So this is the view from the uh, from North Pole. advantage of it, you know, and by enhancing the park, I think we could draw more people down there. But, but thank you for your time and so uh, I, uh, I'm Debbie Patton, and I'm going to uh, talk about how other ports have recognized the benefits of putting in these community uh, amenities. So Cassie's bird here. Can I stop for just one second? Sure. I'm not sharing this, so I need to get back into the camera. Okay. Just a moment, please. Debbie, who put together the presentation you're about to do? The, the whole thing or just this part? All of it. Oh, we, we did it as a group. We did it as a group. It's very good. <sighs> Was Harry Branch involved? I don't think we need to answer those questions. Sorry. No, the, the case studies you're about to show oh, are, are I, very helpful. I, I'm I did that part. Okay. I'll take credit for that. I didn't do that. <laughs> okay. I thought you were talking about the, the overall. Okay. Are we are we back on? Oh, great. Okay. So a a, a number of other ports in the area are uh, recognizing the um, benefits of enhancing the waterfront, and they provide uh, picnic areas or restaurants or amphitheaters or whatever. So um, the benefit to the port is that it, it you know, it provides um, tangible benefits to the taxpayers and it uh, increases uh, tourism revenue um, for area businesses and creates jobs. And then it provides uh, additional uh, port lease revenue. So um, there are numerous examples of uh, urban, working waterfronts, uh, uh, ports here in uh, Western Washington. And this is just a list of several of them, Bellingham and Everett and Vancouver and Tacoma and Silverdale, Seattle. Um, Kalama, some of you have been down to Kalama. Kalama is not really a uh, urban um, port. It's a small town on the uh, river with a freeway running right beside it, uh, but it's super busy port. Um, and so, I'm just going to show you some of um, uh, these sites. And yeah, uh, we also wanted to, uh, Jim Thornton, we wanted to point out that most of these ports and the amenities we're going to show you were formerly industrial lands or contaminated lands that were reclaimed. And by uh, 
career with ecology because I permitted almost all of these facilities at one time or another. Worked at these um, uh, open paper mills and other facilities that are now all public areas. So it's a, an amazing transformation of these. So we have a video here that Missy's going to play. Uh, I got to go to the next slide. Sorry um, about the what they've done up at the port of Bellingham with this uh, picture here is an area that they call the portal container uh, village and it's a uh, private uh, public venture. So uh, Missy, go ahead and show this video, please. Yeah, this is a site of a former Holton paper mill in Bellingham. Thanks, Missy. So you can see that those are shipping containers stacked up, and in the in this uh, in your uh, uh, picture when you go back to the slide, you'll see there's uh, shipping containers all through there, and they have local brewery, they have wine tasting, uh, food trucks, or little pop up restaurants, and it operates day and and into the night, and has many amenities for, as you saw, for uh, families and children and teens and grown-ups and everybody. It's really awesome. And then Port of Everett, um, this is an interesting one because uh, well, they have multiple parks, but this one, the rendering here is the boxcar park, and it incorporates the, the uh, historic warehouser building, which is uh, internationally famous for the amount of um, uh, varieties of wood incorporated into the inside of the structure. And when they opened the boxcar park, it was on the 100th anniversary of opening that warehouse or building. So they moved it to a different location on the port property. And now it's a whiskey and uh, coffee bar and uh, it's leased, uh, the port leases uh, it out to a concessioner. Um, so they have all these, uh, these amenities there at the Port of Everett. And then the Port of Kalama, which I mentioned earlier, um, is right there on the river. Um, uh, they have uh, three uh, parks, and two have ball fields. They're all on the water. And this one uh, is just adjacent, I guess it would be south of the McMinimans there, but they've built an amphitheater. And so you can see that that's the green, you know, the curved with the over it and we envision something like that, that amphitheater on that small cap down at North Point. Apparently wildly uh, popular. They have music and events there all the time. And then Port of Vancouver, again on the river, this is another uh, public uh, private partnership uh, to make this uh, community park right along the river. But that's another side of the Lindsay Cascade open paper mill. I would love to speak to, I think I know some of the background, but um, many of these public amenities were created as part of also redevelopment that, that brought in revenues to the site, whether it was commercial or retail or housing. So this is the part that opens up the space for all the community, but there usually is a component that has a little bit more to do with that's that's true. Um, but what I think is unique is 
notice how they've used the water, the actual waterfront as the community entity. And behind that, what you really want to see may be condos, businesses, other port development facilities, but we're really focused on the community amenities. Uh, so that that's that's what you're seeing. Could, uh, yeah. if, if I can add to that. Uh, uh, Jasmine, with with uh, Vancouver, I I know they they uh, uh, it was fairly fairly complicated development, and and they uh, they utilized the multifamily tax exemption program uh, in order to, to to spur development, and I believe it's an opportunity zone as well. Uh, and uh, so, uh, condos, uh, uh, apartments, uh, uh, some uh, affordable housing as, as well, and and then and then commercial. Uh, and, and you're right because the, the, uh, in order to get all this other stuff developed without a, a huge amount of uh, public public dollars, those private dollars were, were leveraged in, in order to, to do that. Another unique thing about Vancouver is that they relocated the railroad, so they somewhat hidden. It's a little below. It's not underground, but it's below ground, so it's it's not as visible. But so it was a they had to get the railroad through this area. Down to where the actual port industrial is. Okay. It was it was a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. And this is Port of Tacoma, right close here to us. And um, they have a bunch of different parks and uh, remediation sites, but uh, we pick these two uh of the many options we could pick because I wanted to show this top one, which is uh, a habitat restoration. And it has these um, this con concrete ramp that allows easy public access to for people to bring their kayaks down and just unload them in right there. Um, and it goes along the inner part of Commencement Bay. And then the bottom photo is called Julia Gulch, and that's 31 acres forested open space um, that the port of Tacoma purchased to serve as a buffer between the Northeast Tacoma uh, neighborhoods and the uh, industrial uh, working waterfront right there. And it's full of native plants, which is what Quentin was uh, and Sue both were talking about uh, as an option for the Billy Frank Trail. Another thing about the Port of Tacoma, which I think is really important and pertinent to hear, is they use a lot of their dredge material for uh, restoration of tidelands uh, and, and creation of uh, buildable areas. Because a lot of it was contaminated, it was capped, and they did a huge in water capping program, uh, which was actually a restoration of the uh, tidelands. So they contaminated material and then covered with clean material to restore um, really that intertidal area. Thank you. And then this is uh, Silverdale, uh, also not that far away. Um, this is nice. It's right by the main pier, but they've turned it all into a playground and picnic tables and bathrooms, and you can rent it for birthday parties and it's like a public parking check, you know, reserve. It's really, really, really pretty little spot they live in. And then Seattle uh, has the most of all, but that, I mean, makes sense it's the biggest port, but they have 60 um, uh, parks and public access sites with bike trails and uh, lots of habitat restoration sites and fishing piers and shoreline access. and. Seattle. Uh, other than they have a lot of land, and I'm just looking at this picture, it almost looks like a, a dredger out there. You can see those, those big, dark, kind of triangular things or spuds that they put down to hold the, the, the boat in place. So that's what I, that's what I, I wanted it to be. Uh, yeah, obviously, they have a lot of contaminated and still are cleaning up the Duwamish. And so there's a, a lot of reclamation projects. Uh, in if you want more information on Duwamish, I had pages and pages, but we had to keep to a time limit. But I could show you. I could send them to you later. If you want. OK, there you go. All right. So that concludes our formal presentation. And just going back to why we're here today.
So are there low cost interim steps that can be taken to show the port is committed to making progress and making its, des its destination waterfront area more accessible, more family friendly? I think we saw lots of examples where other ports have looked at what they had and decided, okay, what would be best for them? And I think what we're proposing with our three recommendations is here's some ideas for this peninsula that we think might work. And obviously there are a lot of details we all would need to work through, but we're hoping to get some enthusiasm, some excitement and action so that you can go to the public and say, hey, yeah, we got a new commission. We got a new executive director. Look at progress is being made. You know, have you been to North Point lately? Would be something that I'd love to hear talked about on the streets. Can so, I can check out a little bit. what's that? Great. Go for it. it. There is one, one specific ask we have here, and that's for the landscape architect. You know, I know you're working on a, a master plan, but in light of that, we're hoping that we can do some interim steps to support the support the growth of uh, North Point in that area uh, and wrap that into a master plan. We, we think that there's some value, like Bob was saying, in the short term in trying to do that. So there is an ask here, a uh, financial ask. And I'd just interject that the, the timeline that I think this group has talked about is that if if a small investment is made um, in bringing in a, a landscape architect um, at, or um, to develop some of the the ideas for the North Point, that could be done in time for budget discussions um, at the end of this year, and, and perhaps even uh, legislative ask to support that proposal and that plan. So you're recommending a landscape architect for the entire peninsula or no, phasing yeah. it kind of or no just for the uh just for the park for the park okay and, and the cap okay. a small cap small asphalt cap that's just the extent of the ask okay i got you and on that note could you go back in the slides to the port of kalama picture please sure um as far as I can see, right now the port has some really excellent programming, but it's starting to unroll for summer because we have like this concert series and I hope you'll all come see Queen Mother with me on June 29th. Even though it's family friendly, I might get a sitter for my kids. <laughs> um, and uh, this idea of kind of making it a more formal amphitheater that's more clearly accessible is one I think I've heard come from the staff level or that there's been some discussion. So just invite, I'd like to invite our director if she has any thoughts about how this fits into kind of where you've seen things going with North Point um, given its current programming. Oh, well, it's definitely, uh, I mean, the is awesome. So it looks great. And it's definitely along the lines of what we were thinking in terms of North Point trying to have it be more of a gathering space and not a like space dedicated to a single company business or something. And so, yeah, it's most definitely um, along the lines of what we were thinking. And then another question, maybe for James or, or our director, we've talked about a master plan and a master plan with all the parcels that we'd be unlocking and potentially developing over time. I mean, we can be talking about development for many that wouldn't start for 10 years out, right? Um, we have all the dredging and remediation to do that's the top priority in terms of sequencing it before with the Deschutes restoration. So one thing that um, I've been thinking about in general is when there are investments we can make that make a difference even for the next 10 years. It may not be forever investments like building out infrastructure that's supposed to pay off over the next 60 years, but it brings the community to the waterfront. And at WPPA, we were able to hear from some of the Bellingham executive director and how they very deliberately created these amenities to bring people down. That pump track probably won't stay where it is. There's plans that the city's gonna relocate it to a larger parcel further inland. But on the near term, it was sequenced 
to make the waterfront available to be a magnet and start to build off of. So I just wondering if any of you have thought about that as part of this proposal. Wouldn't you agree? We <laughs> all. Yeah. It's also though really important to remember that we have to protect the environment and everything that we do on the port property needs to take that into consideration. We don't want to contaminate things anymore. <laughs> we want to make sure that things are clean. Clean fun. And then we can preserve that beautiful wildlife that we got to see. It's not going to be as valuable. And that's a big part of the value, I think, of going down there is enjoying that nature, seeing that wildlife. We got to keep it clean. Could I speak to that? Um, I've been sailing here a long, long time. And I can tell you things are greatly diminished over what I used to see. Um, South Bud Inlet is a degraded water body, and let's not kid ourselves. I think anything we do on the Port Peninsula, our first alternative should be cleanup and restoration. And that doesn't mean we can't put buildings into that, but the, the first step should be science. <clears throat> then we should do our planning and design. Um, I have a, a, a blog, um, and um, it's called gardenbayblog.com. And there's a lot of data that I've collected and put in there. And I'd encourage everyone to look at that. Um, I don't object to anything we're planning here. I think there are a lot of great ideas. Let's just do it in a way that would restore salt marsh, high flats, overhanging vegetation, um, actual real parameters, not a pile of rock with some uh, native plants, but on top or whatever. But it's the upper beach, the rack zone that we want to restore. Um, if you want to look for models, I would go anywhere in San Francisco Bay, anywhere in California. It's the way that things are done there. We first we restore and clean up and then we develop. Um, anyway. It, in terms of the ask that the POCAC is bringing us um, about a landscape architect kind of funding for some design, do you think that that can be consistent with what you're telling us, Mr. Branch? In other words, do you think there are landscape architects who are versed in how the rack zone and the upper beach is restored as part of a public park type design process? I'm sure there are. I don't have any names, but... Um, I would say um, maybe landscape architect wouldn't be the word I would be looking for, but someone who specialized in restoration, shore restoration. Uh, a lot of opportunities here in Olympia in general, South Bud Inlet, we could do so much here. Uh, 1979, there was an Audubon Christmas bird count. They counted 3,000 roughly 3,000, oh, 3,760 birds. There were 35 species. And it just, over the Christmas uh, bird counts, they go down and down and down to like 165, maybe. I don't know what we would find today, not very many. Um, lots of fish of all kinds. And uh, there were some salmon, not a lot went through the river because of the waterfall, but they spawned in the streams and they migrated through. Um, this was a very rich estuarine environment. A lot of eel grass, salt marsh, tide flats, forage fish, sand lance, surf smell. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place a couple hundred years ago, and it could be again. We don't have to destroy things because we live among them. Um, we're learning more and more that we can restore urban estuarine environments, especially urban forests, um, it's all about how we live, how we manage the land where we live. And uh, like I say, I think a lot of really good ideas here. Let's just put restoration and clean up at the front. We're making t-shirts that say more salt marsh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring them, we'll bring them. <laughs> 
we can get him if they want. Of who is it? Oh, no, it's not Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. I think I would argue that we can do both at the same time. And when we're talking about site A, we're basically talking away from the waterfront. The Billy Frank Park is right there at the waterfront. And it will help build support for future funding efforts, future restoration efforts. My dream is someday to be able to go swimming off North Point. And right now it's just so ludicrous to even think about, it. but maybe someday my great, great grandchildren, <laughs> I won't be doing it, will be able to go swimming from this area that we took some interim steps today where lots of people saw it. It's a beautiful place as we've been sharing. So I think Bob has a really good point that bringing the public to this area to see what's there now and start to imagine what could be or, or maybe learn the history of what was there before, like Harry's talking about, could really build support for the effort that the course is going to engage in the next however many years it's going to take to really clean up and restore ecosystem services in the inlet. Um, it's a big, big undertaking and it'll take a lot of support from the public. If we can get folks to that space to experience it, to see it, see the view that, um, that Quentin captured in the video, um, I think it will help to build support for the effort. Yeah, just to go over what Bob said, we're not talking about going to the, the seashore here. We're going just on the park and the, the cap. We don't plan on going into the bay at all. That's not what, what a landscape architect would, would help us do. You know, it sounds like you had narrowly defined what you were bringing to us today to be the update on this action step. And um, it's well received, at least by me. I think it's great. I was hoping, and we have a lot of time set aside for today's meeting, um, to also be able to engage in understanding how you see yourselves partnering with this commission. It may be a conversation you've had in the past with um, Commissioner Harding and Commissioner Isle, but um, I mean, I would- so That's the second part of the agenda. Oh, it is. Okay. That's a beautiful segue. <laughs> well, and before we go there, yeah. let, let's make sure I just- Just didn't want to- Any other questions, say. comments for- Just thank you for the information. Yeah, yeah. 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 very yeah. impressive. Yeah, the, it's very informative and I really appreciate all the, all the effort that was put into it, especially, you know, all over the animals and, and different beautiful um, creatures that enjoy the waterfront. We need this more in our commission meetings. We need this community perspective and um, and the work you brought here. We'll come back anytime. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, beautiful segue, uh, because we um, wanted to take some of the rest of this time to talk about how we can serve mission, how we can uh, connect you to community voices, how we can be um, of, of aid in the work that this commission is and, and staff are undertaking moving forward. Um, and as you can see from the presentation, this subcommittee um, is just loaded with talent that is really relevant to the issue um, of the work that they're doing. You have you know, people that have worked on restoration projects and reclamation projects, people that have been involved in community groups, involved in sailing and and uh, the waterfront activities, and um, people who are very closely tied to the working waterfront. Um, through so the the um, this is a, a microcosm of what the POCAC is at large, and just the amount of experience and how targeted it is to the work that I think the port staff and commission are doing. Um, I in the last week asked some of the folks on the POCAC to, to share with me just a few thoughts about you know, why they were here, why they choose to give their time to this um, endeavor, you know, what issues they're most interested in engaging with, and then what experience they bring. And just some of the things that I heard, um, one, you know, why, why people chose to join the POCAC, it's all the things you would expect, right? Service to community, opportunity, that the port has the ability to give back <laughs> the contribution. Um, the experience that we have on the POCAC, um, public affairs, facilitation, budgeting, uh, engineering, 
environmental engineering, trade, um, all of these skills that people bring to this uh, to this group. And then the issues, it really a lot of the folks have decided to join the POCAC because of the opportunities with Bud Inlet and, and the estuary restoration. Um, Commissioner Basavada, you a little bit ago mentioned top priority uh, in the same sentence as Bud Inlet restoration and estuary restoration. And that's really comes through loud and clear when you talk to the members of the POCAC. That is, those are the issues that the people here are most interested in, not to the exclusion of everything else, but those are the things that we're most interested in. And so building on the success of the, the Destination Waterfront subcommittee, we would like to engage in a discussion about what would the next subcommittee be? And I think our, um, our proposal is that we find a way to stand up a subcommittee focused on estuary restoration, flood inlet cleanup, and and sea level rise, and those um, interlocking issues that the that the commission and staff are going to be working on. That we find a way to have a POCAC subcommittee that can really support those efforts and lend uh, some weight to that um, to, to those endeavors. Um, and I, you know, I look to. To Don, uh, who also has thoughts about this, and then also open it up to the members of the POCAC to just have a dialogue with you all about how we think we might serve the the effort and um, connect these efforts to the public in both directions. Well, I think Joel covered it for the most part. Um, one thing I'd like to let you know, and from our perspective, we've had some general conversations about this, and I think we all kind of agree that it's important to take a holistic approach to all this in a way the um the estuary restoration is is an opportunity to actually look at it in a, a larger frame the whole area in terms of what we might um want to accomplish and we might uh, even be able to help you in that regard in terms of of relationships you know with with other entities um both government entities and uh, the public any other kind of um, organizations that are out there, you know, looking into this kind of uh, this work. So um, we would suggest that we would develop a second subcommittee. This would be our second subcommittee. And it would be in some, it would entail something to do with either restoration or maybe more general, just the environmental yeah. issues that are um, on the table. Um, and we can we can have a conversation now about that, or if you'd like, we can have more conversations amongst ourselves, and we can come up and with staff and come up with um, a recommendation to you about you know what we're thinking if that would be a better approach. Thoughts, comments. Um, I'll just say one thing, Don, you brought up a good thing. During your presentation, one of the things that caught my attention was the mention of uh, the public-private partnerships that help to, to bring these projects uh, together. Um, and I would hope that the next phase of or the next task that the POCAC takes on, that could be an element of that, uh, that task to help facilitate some of those uh, relationships. Yeah, my only, uh, definitely the environmental issues are um, the challenge of our generation at the port, right? And the challenge of the kind of new commission we have wanting to be stewards. My concern about breaking that out as a subcommittee is just the concern about the holistic approach you were first referencing. For example, the next step I'd like to see on this um, destination advisory work is something where if Sue, Harry, and James would come forward with a shared recommendation about like what we should be asking for in this, whether it's landscape architecture, but the RFP for North Point, I know there's a lot of the community that would feel, gosh, th these people all see this as a legitimate way to go about it, that it would bring trust from people who know you through your work and long careers in the community. And so I, I worry about the people who have like the strong environmental interests, like going into a corner about scientific studies instead of helping influence, like, how are we going to develop? Like, what do we do that's responsible? And so maybe you can tell me that's I'm making a false 
I'm setting up a false conflict because actually how you would envision the environmental committee working with, for example, the destination waterfront committee, that's what I'd like you to address. Um, would you like to address any Well, I would, I would just, I think, make a point that I think we have a diversity of opinions on the POCAC, and I think that's a really good thing. We're not um, in an echo chamber here. Um, and, and, I, and I think that our strength largely is because we have different lived experiences, different relationships to this waterfront area and different um, ideas about what it could be moving forward and what the challenges are. Um, and, I, and I really think that that's an important piece of what we bring to the table. Um, and, and if we were to put together a subcommittee working on this specifically, I would encourage those diverse voices uh, to be on that subcommittee so that we aren't just pick all the environmental engineers on POCAC and put them on a subcommittee, <laughs> right? Um, I, I would I would encourage um, that we that we're thoughtful about making sure that all those voices are represented. We've had some general discussions about if we have multiple subcommittees, that the subcommittees would actually make recommendations to the full POCAC. So that's one way that we would ensure that, you know, all voices were heard. I will mention, um, I don't I don't think this is official, but I've had uh, conversations with the environmental director um, and he seems open to the idea of having uh, a subcommittee supporting him and his team in this work and and interacting and and the the subcommittee providing feedback and and the staff providing direction or or asking uh, you know, can you get us more information about these, you know, these questions? Um, and so I, I see it as if done thoughtfully a way to provide support and, and just expand the capacity of, of the staff. I think it's really important to have um, <clears throat> different voices working on the environment and the economy and the environment and development together. And and there's, you know, there's adversarial uh, past issues on the POCAC that that we have. We've had issues, you know, with with between certain people on the POCAC, the estuary folks, the lake folks, for instance. I mean, that's, that's a known fact. But there's no reason why we can't sit down with the port's mission in mind and figure out how the environment can be protected while we're developing amazing things for the public to access and to be a part of. There's no reason we can't do it. And if you look at things in the future, like the design of the estuary, and the, the team that's working on that, they're thinking that way all the time. They're thinking about how we can do public access, how we can bring boats back in, where are the fishing opportunities going to be? All those things are happening right now. How can we um, how can we walk side by side with the sea level rise process and the, and the salt marsh? How's that going to sequester carbon? You know, where can we put it so it doesn't interrupt the um, development opportunities that we know we need? Um, so there's no there's just there's no reason why we can't all sit down and do it. And if we get testy with each other, you know, who can slap us down? <laughs> he is tall. Yeah. yeah. He's a, he's a big guy. I would like to do a plug while we have you here that the port is currently soliciting for what is dubbed an environmental communicator position, but what I hope could become a real more environmental policy and engagement lead position, as <laughs> that's my hope. Um, so because when I think of sort of what you're talking about and the resourcing we have, we have an great, Sean's a great environmental manager and he's spending all his time trying to even chase down the insurance proposals and understand you know, the, the, the long history of our, our um, files and relationships to the properties. So it's clear that we need help here. I just struggle on how, like, do you have any thoughts of how you would work would you be working directly to advise Sean or would I saw, I read the resolution that's currently operative. Like, would we be at a meeting like this without a formal 
order, like just talking and saying, yes, will you please come back within a month with a formal recommendation for um, an early budget amendment to fund that landscape architecture? Like, do we just ask you like that and then look for general Sarah and Maggie go like this? What, what how, how does the back and forth work anyway, also with the commission? Uh, Commissioner, I can tell you since I've been here, which is not that long, but uh, I think it was my first day, uh, Commissioner Ayal and Commissioner Harding asked me, <laughs> asked my opinion on some some ideas regarding the POCAC. So um, what I understand has happened is that um, the commission has, as a, as a whole, has been uh, making uh, decisions about what the ask the assignments are to the, uh, the POCAC. And staff is, has uh, worked with the commission and with POCAC members coming up with recommendations and assignments. I have not been a part of that, except for the one very uh, short instance uh, at, at my uh, onset. So um, that's how it's been in the past. That doesn't mean it, ha it has to be that way going forward. There are a number of ways it could be approached. And um, so, so I just wanted to throw that out there that it seems like we have a, a clean, a, Potentially, you could have a clean slate if you like. The proposal would be a great next step. I, from what I'm understanding, an environmental committee would be really, or subcommittee would be really helpful. And there are some things that I think they could help Sean with. Sea, sea level rise considerations, maybe the sampling, but that proposal would really be key in knowing what those things are and what we can expect. One of the areas in the seats personal for me, but is the contaminated sediments and the dredging and what's going to be done. I think that's the big, big question. Probably one of the biggest investments the poor city will be making in the next 10 years. And I was formerly the state's expert in contaminated sediments, led dredging, dredge disposal for 10 years in all the ports in the state of Washington. Um, so that's an area that I'm, that I'm obviously very interested in. Um, and I see as being part of this environmental group is the port is going to be working with ecology, uh, the EPA, decisions are going to be made. Uh, and I think that personally, I'd like to see the POCAC involved at least in an advisory role uh, in going forward. Um, at least from my, and I've only been on the POCAC for a little bit more than a year, but a lot has gone on in history, and I don't think the POCAC or the citizens have been involved at all in any of these decisions that have been made in negotiations with ecology. And, and, and I think you know we would be in an advisory role, obviously not making the decisions role, but making an advisory role. And I think I am really impressed with the expertise around this group. I mean, we have some really good people. Bob, you're being real quiet over there, but you know, <laughs> I know Bob's history because I worked with him probably 30 years ago on some of his projects. So, you know, that is- Silence and endorsement. <laughs> it's an endorsement with what Sue said, and that is I think we can have a testy discussion and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and come back and come back with some logical, thoughtful guidance because I've been on the waterfront since 1981 at a marina, operating marina. I had my engineering business here since that time. And I agree with what Jim is, is saying, and that is, is that I think the OCAC can help staff, help regulators understand the interface that goes on. As the, it's too often we get behind a, a an agenda, pushing the agenda. The agenda is really to make this a welcoming, environmentally friendly, business friendly. Front downtown Olympia, you need a group to help. That's my I I interrupted you, but I want to give it back to you because, as a sediment expert, I have a question to build on as you continue what you were saying, which is. I'm not the sediment expert. You are. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I would say, yeah, my in psychology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, even better for the poker. <laughs> but um, as I've been engaging people, kind of from Port of Tacoma or other scientists and the environmental scientists, I've been meeting at um, the different conferences. 
what I'm hearing is there may be a disconnect between what a reg what the regulator ecology is accustomed to and will mandate and what possibly some citizens will consider the best practice or the actual direction that should be taken. Science evolves. It's And as you know, having been a regulator, like it's not really black and white. We like to rely, we meaning the port management over time from what I've seen on saying, oh, well, this got, this was, this got the stamp of approval from the regulator. So there's what conversation is there to be had? You're, you're raising concerns, but our regulator said it was okay. How do you see um, a, the Citizens Environmental Committee kind of engaging in that dynamic? Well, I guess going back to Joel, there will be a lot of different opinions, and especially with contaminated sediments. I think there's there's a really good quote the other day. Uh, we trust in God, but all others need to bring data. <laughs> and, and that's what we need to look at, is the data and, and experiences with other ports around the United States. I was on a National Academy of Sciences committee where we studied what they were doing in Boston Harbor, New York Harbor, Tampa Bay, and et cetera. So what, what is, you know, and that's where I, I see that we can help kind of parse through that with our diverse opinions and expertise to advise. And, and that's, that's what I see our role as being. Um, I don't know if, if I can go any farther than that. Yeah. So a specific example, regime, Swantown Marina, there's talk about it having to be taken out and rebuilt. Um, I'm part of a community. I've got my boat at Swantown. I'm part of South Sound Sailing Society. That is a very big deal and will impact a lot of people who tend to be pretty <clears throat> loud at times. So we potentially could help facilitate conversations about, okay, what does this mean? Does it have to be done? If it has to be done, how can it be done in stages? You got the private marinas on the other side and just really having in-depth, honest conversations so that all of those boat owners, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them, are not negatively impacted. So we could help facilitate those conversations, as an example. Yes, that would be really important because I think that uh, um, not only would they, you know, be impacted, but they, they should be um, they should be in the conversation from the very beginning and, and so that we understand what, what their needs are and, and uh, get their input as well as far as how, we, how we're going to proceed with this and what the ultimate, you know, the, the end product, how, does that, how is that going to look and how is that going to affect it? And I don't know where we all stand on the future of the Marine Terminal. I think we have diverse viewpoints and obviously that future impacts dredging plans. Mm -hmm. And having that conversation earlier rather than later, when those plans are being developed, this would probably be a group that would have some lively conversations about where the marine terminal ought to be in 10 years. So, one of the big issues in contaminated sediments is many of the public just want to see it gone, dredged, put in rail cars, taken somewhere and dumped. But there's a lot of examples in Puget Sound. And there's one right here of Olympia. Going back to the 80s, one of the most contaminated sites in the port area was one Triada Marina. It's not no longer there. Bob knows about it. He knows this story. And, and this was probably 1983 or 84. We dredged that contaminated material, dug a deeper hole, dumped the contaminated material back in the hole. Covered up That's right out here. So that is a way to deal with contaminated sediments. But I'm afraid the public today they want it out of here. They they don't. But you know we when I say we I'm talking about the ecology had a monitoring program for almost ten years. Those contaminants never move. Ten feet below the surface, below the biological 
area of activity. And that sediment is still there. And there's another one, uh, there's two or three actually in the port of Seattle, same thing. Uh, and your your site confined to sports area, it's rather than essentially, it's a we didn't dig as deep a hole, and we paved over instead of sediment. Yeah, uh, and that's in in Seattle. Same, it's actually, I think now one of the uh, areas where they bring in the uh, uh, the, the ships, the, the cruise ships. Um, so, I think we're if. Okay, I can look at issues like that and, and help the public understand that if something like that was it's okay, again, I go back to the data. Data shows in the all of the United States that that is a good way to dispose of contaminated sediments. Or, like in uh, uh, Port of Tacoma, contaminated material was spread out in the wetlands and then capped with clean material to create a great new intertidal habitat. And I think you know, that's where OCAT can be useful, looking at that kind of information and saying that is a reasonable way. And it's, it's uh, so anyway. I think that can also doing. help you with economics. Yes. I, I just want to reiterate a point um, because I think you asked, you know, what's the recommendation? Well, we, as the POCAC, we take our direction from the commission. So I, I don't think we want to get too far out getting s specific about what we think the recommendation should be. Here's about what you want. Um, and with all the expertise that we have on the committee is is not uh, is not a substitute or not meant to supplant the, the expertise and the talent of the staff. We want to support the staff. Um, but I think we're very um, confident of our role, and and um, and so we take our direction from the commission, and we don't want to um, overstep our position by by being real specific about things that that we would like to see. I think that that's not really our place. Um, but I would think that uh, with this panel of experts that you have, you must have an opinion of what what the natural next steps, what the flow would be. I, I think we have <laughs> come to a consensus um, with, amongst, uh, on our group and, and deliver that if that's what was asked for. You know, if you, if you were interested, like uh, you were saying about developing partnerships with the community, nonprofits and, and for I mean, we would have some ideas about that, which we could, you know, put to, we wouldn't, wouldn't want to get over ahead of our skis and start talking seriously with these groups. Right. Without some uh, feedback from you all, but that that's something we could design, possibly, and, and, and present to you. Say we would like to talk to these groups with these out potential outcome. It, you can potentially fill a real staff void because we don't have an economic development expert on our staff, and we also don't have um, sort of like general policy type um, staff supporting the commission. Um, I don't think, Joel, it's getting ahead of your skis to say, here's a specific thing. We could review methods of sediment disposal and how they've been effectively used um, in recent history, right? Like, I think that there is a trust that might exist for what comes from the POCAC that apparently does not get conferred to our, the private teams of consultants that we hired. So having that sort of separate look from citizens engaged, I think, is very valuable. When you were bringing up Quentin, uh, Commissioner Isle's comment about private and public partnerships, the sort of next step off of Debbie Patton's presentation is sort of like and something I've been asking Director Smith about, but she just doesn't have staffing to put it together, is sort of what were those beginning partnerships that brought the money to the table to get the bigger picture going, the, the, the bigger redevelopment. When you see Bellingham, it's part of a it's part of a whole set of things over 10 years. Like it would be great. Um, and so what I'd wonder is if we could have a mechanism where your chair and vice chair could simply send over via the executive director, here are some things we, we some specific questions we'd like to work on. And then we as a committee commission could say, yeah, here's how I'd prioritize them. If, if there's 
maybe different people, but yeah, we definitely one, two, and three. We'd love to get an update on where you're at by August. Um, just I, a quick question to my other commissioners: Do you feel like that's viable, or like do you have a different way you could see it? Sounds valuable and viable to me. It's just that staff time question. Um, staff review. I think if I could, uh, you know, a lot of what you guys are talking about um, will be part of the master planning process that we want to do, as well as the cleanup plans. And they're really integrated because, you know, the decisions we make about how to use beneficially reuse the sediment impacts, you know, what could happen in terms of development. So my thought would be to somehow sort of create a, a a mechanism, a timeline, a plan to integrate these guys or insert them into various parts of stages of the master planning process and get their feedback um, as we go. Is that, is that aligned with what you were thinking? No trouble. Commissioner Masavada. I worry about um, input coming after RFPs have already gone out. So when I think of where you get it. Sometimes I, I'd wanted to actually inform what we're seeking. Mm -hmm. And so that's all. I mean, big picture, right. I don't have like a gap chart of what we're doing on. No, I don't think you have one either. That's been withheld from me. So um, so my only worry is that kind of like really ideal dovetailing, if it if it has the effect of kind of putting their input on hold indefinitely because it's waiting until the right moment comes up instead of letting it happen organically and then possibly being able to reap benefits from it as you go into yeah. your actual work. Seems all seems my preference because I've seen we are a little, we just have limited, the stack yeah. issue that Commissioner Tong just brought up. Well, that's, maybe I wasn't articulating very well. That's kind of what I was thinking was getting their input at points in the process that would inf allow and sort of inform the next next steps or the next work that was done so um it's just just um my whole career i've done what you're talking about doing so i, I have to lay out my observation in the process you know i think the suggestion that came out of going out of pocac is that we have a second uh advisory committee you know at, in, somehow tied to the environmental part of it we already have a destination waterfront part of it what I'm seeing a gap on is some very basic steps that the port is going through right now that we're informed on. And then when we see that, then we can say, hey, we can put some valuable input at this point or this point or this point. And then in reverse type of thing, if we start down the pathway with two working committees, one being the working waterfront and, and the other being the environmentally, however we, we want to define that, Again, we can say from our perspective, what we're hearing, what we're seeing, here's some things that I think are, are, going, are going to become an issue that we need to have an inter and we figure out an interface in between the staff and our group to have a discussion. And out of that can identify priorities or, or timeliness or sensitivities in process. Um, uh, Jack and I uh, worked on CLIPA 20 years. We understand the waterfront in many ways and um, the so we know where a lot of those sensitivities are. And so we can flag those sensitivities. That doesn't mean we have an answer. It doesn't mean that our answer is going to be listened to. But at least it's the flag that says, hey, here's an interchange. And, and that's where we can become helpful as a POCAC because we have we are representing a larger community in, in a very diverse setting. So we can flag that. And just I'll give you one specific example. Uh, some of your staff came and talked to our HOA. I live on over by, uh, by Free Point Park, Squaxinut Park. And uh, so they came and talked to our HOA. And I feed, my feedback was, that's a poor presentation. It did answer some very basic questions that I thought the citizens needed to, to know. And so that that's where we can, and I did then have a discussion with staff. And we, we had a very positive, very constructive input to help them understand what that was the reaction that came out of that process. So it's that kind of back and forth that I think would be very valuable. But to do that, we need to at least have some sense of structure of, of milestones. So we can, so we're not taking a lot of staff time. We're not taking a lot of our time, but when we come together, it's productive time to have a dialogue. And then, it, then, then, then 
than you as commissioners and, and Alex as the executive, you get, you're still the traffic cops. You're still gonna make the decision, not us. We're, we're just inputters at that point. So this week we're getting together with the consultants who are helping us with the master plan and we're gonna be laying out that kind of a plan. And we can just um, bring it to you guys and talk about where would be the best place to get your input. Um, so another specific example is the waterfront center. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. I think you are correct. We would love to have seen the RFP before it went out, um, because I think we have some diverse views on that whole project, and I think perhaps there could be some benefits of having that discussion. Um, and. It, when staff brought it to the commission, maybe the commission might like it a little more. So that is an example of if it can be done in the process that the staff and the commission has, well, okay, we've got a little thing right here where we're going to spend an hour talking with OCAC to get their thoughts before the RFP goes out. Well, and maybe that that maybe sometimes that's with POCAC and the commission, I and mean, to the extent they're willing to to solicit input uh, after before something's fully baked um there could be value in both directions but the other thing i wanted to share was I, I would really love if we just on a monthly cadence had what it doesn't have to be joel or don but whoever's designated to come to the commission and say here's an update of what we've been talking about and and by the way you know bob and jack have a lot of awareness and they wanted to flag this thing for you you know or just unmediated input but public because we are transparent and public i i would like some form for that as well i would agree i think that's a really great idea to get the pocac some more exposure to the board as well because there are various public members at each meeting so hearing from you and getting an update would be very important i was going to ask are you re referencing to coming to work session or coming to commission meetings for this well, purpose that's a question i mean do you have a this obviously is special, right? That everyone's around here and we're given it this much time. What we used to do, um, what we used to do was when we had individual projects that we worked on, that the committee would give, uh, a, or each project committee, each subcommittee would give a report at each POCAC meeting every month. And then um, quarterly, or whenever we were ready, the chair or some member of that committee would come and talk. Like I came and talked about um, apprenticeship utilization because I was on that committee. We, you know, we'd come and, and give an update, but we could also do it at a work session. So, but I think it would be beneficial because then you, it, it would be a two way street. We would, we would get clarification of what you wanted and then we could inform you of what we had discovered or learned in the interim. And while we do have the public who attend the work sessions, I think the regular meetings are watched more by the public and will report it on to get the exposure of the POCAC out there too, which I think it's good for the public to know you will know about the hard work that you're doing. Yeah, my, my, one thought I have is that uh, the port's a complicated operation. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to get into the knitting of the port. In other words, I wouldn't want to get into such detail that we're, you know, creating um, barriers to the port getting things done. I think, you know, we should pick the issues pretty carefully as to what we want to get involved in. The staff and the port have, you know, they have ways to get things done that, you know, if they're just day-to-day -day operational things or even just planned pro our projects. We have to be very cautious about what we get our feet into. That's what I, that's the thoughts I have. If I may, since we're short on time, I just want to make sure that any of the other POCAC members that haven't had a lot to say, uh, that, that we give them the opportunity to to address the commission. I don't know if Jack or Anthony or Darlene, if you had anything you wanted to add to the discussion, I just want to make sure that there's space for that. Okay. Well, the only thing that in this just recent discussion is that POCAC only meets once a month, correct? Or to go to a work session with the commissioners, they meet once a month, correct? So it doesn't sound like there's enough time for the POCAC, which meets on a Monday, to be ready for a presentation to the 
Commissioners on Tuesday. The commission meets three to four times a month. Our meetings are on Mondays, except when we wait once a month. <laughs> That's one of the reasons, though, that we establish subcommittees because the subcommittees meet more often. I think the ask would be for a representative to come to some meetings and give a presentation. Maybe there are topics that you would like our views on that you are dealing with. So, and you know, you're going to have a meeting and next month on such and such. And the practice at the port appears to be that we have to kind of. <laughs> If we have to direct it each time, it's like we almost have to, okay, so I would like to hear from the POCAC on this topic next week get, or in the future, and then three people vote for it, and then it might get calendared or agended. And maybe we want that level of process around it. The other opportunity would be a monthly report where you know we might share things that that we think are of interest. So I, I hear what you're saying about sideboards and and I will yield that to others. The one thing I also wanted to raise is the airport is not a topic we've really discussed. It makes me wonder about the this composition because uh, there's a lot of people interested in the environment. It seems more on the sediment side. We've had already some issues like card issues about what was raised by Black Hills Audubon. And we have an airport, which is like the prime endangered species habitat for two species. So I am curious about how the POCAC would relate to the update of the airport master plan. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would be, I would be interested in getting involved in that. I, I do have some contacts at Black Hill, I'm a member, and um, have talked to them about some of this. Mm -hmm. So it does seem if we had a series of things, like for me, it would be the, the, the whole sediment waterfront stuff, the, you called it working waterfront, community asset um, vision, but also the airport like has to be there. And and if we had a question for you on each of those with sort of your own recommended cadence of coming to update us. We also have uh, interest and- um, It's not here. And, okay. and um, port operations as well. Meaning? Well, we have, just haven't discussed it yet. Um, the, the Marine Terminal, um, the, the airport, we have, we have experience on our, on our group in those areas too. Just haven't broached it yet. And and I I, I believe we, we talked about potentially standing up an economic development committee as well, where those issues in the airport and, and some other things could be rolled into. Uh, and I, I think that was being discussed at the last meeting, and, and but perhaps that was decided not, not to go forward at this point. Or, uh, I kind of thought one step at a time. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Good. It's it's definitely something that that I have an interest in. And so I guess for me, I'm summarizing. I, I respect if your recommendation is the subcommittee because that's how you wrap your mind around kind of how you move forward. But what I care about is the questions that we ask you to do and how and bringing them forward more than how you self-organize and Commissioner, I may I offer some uh, some advisory committees will create a work plan that addresses a number of issues, and that work plan doesn't it, it doesn't have to be you know uh, a two year work plan. It can be shorter term work plans that uh, that the advisory committee helps develop in conjunction uh, with staff, and then floats it to the commission so that you have a chance to see if this is on point for you, so that you're not completely disconnected, and then you have then that. The groups, uh, smaller groups are probably a little bit more easy to work with if they form independently that way. Um, getting 17 people, you know, ish to, to work on uh, one particular project sometimes can be a little unwieldy, but the smaller groups are been very efficient. I think Destination Waterfront is a prime example of that. So that might be a model that this, this group thinks about is uh, creating some work plans for a couple of uh, smaller subgroups that they and and sharing that that work plan with you to get your to get your buy off to make sure it's heading in the right direction. I think tying that into what Alex um, said earlier about the master planning can help form those groups and be able to report back to the commission on how to um, their work fitting in with the master planning that includes environmental stewardship, economic development, um, bridging the two together um, in a science-based approach. I think it's it would be amazing to have, you know, subcommittees working on work plans. And I would recommend that since they meet monthly, 
that, you know, if those subcommittees were to be formed, that they could be put on the agenda at a at a regular commission meeting and present and have que you know questions and discussion presented at that time, so that you know there is transparency and that the public is informed and all the citizens can hear the feedback from the POCAC and feel, you know, that they are included in in our master planning. I just want to say thank you, Camille, for clarifying what I was trying to say. But <laughs> well, um, I just want to express to the commissioners my appreciation for this group. They have uh, just been a, a real um, enhanced my career um, in terms of just relationships. They've been really great to work with, and diversity. <laughs> Yeah, and like they, I want to echo what they said. They they do not all have the same opinions, and they work with each other and uh, come to and work and work some through some of that. And I know that they're very eager to be supportive. So you've all done just a, a, a wonderful job. And if before you move on, if we, if I could at least ask, and we could um, continue it with a formal resolution, maybe next week, but a destination waterfront team would engage with Mr. Branch on um, your recommendations for how we can do both at the same time. In other words, the idea of moving forward with the North Point, sort of a plan for that kind of arena type outdoor amenity development, um, but consistent with environmental concerns. Would be amazing. Yeah, I think anything we would do would be consistent with environmental concerns. But we're That's talking about a very small base that doesn't impact the waterfront, right? And if uh, yeah, if Harry signs his name to that, that would be just perfect. Sailing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will you navigate? I was thinking like this. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Trip. Yeah. No, there are ways to enhance the waterfront, and we could. More salt yeah, marsh in the vegetation that we chose. Yeah, exactly. So it's not just you know it's not just here's the land here's the water. How do we integrate? I can give you one example. Um, the place I learned to sail in California, Palo Alto Yacht Club. Um, there was a marina with boats and and a building, nice buildings. Um, when I was a kid, you go there today. The building is still there but it's surrounded by salt marsh. Uh, the marina, if it were there, would be further out. You can still see the pilings coming up through the salt marsh, but um, it's um, it's just an example. 100,000 acres of uh, tide flats and salt marsh have been restored in San Francisco Bay. And uh, it's, you know, it's a great example, uh, but we could build things we could, we could build a building in Salt Marsh that say, oh, even will overhang the upper beach. Um, you can actually do this. If you get the building permitted before the restoration, it, it can remain right in that location, but the beach underneath might not might be completely different. And you can incorporate tide pools and light wells and other features into buildings. Uh, but we could kind of or through these ideas, I suspect. Let's um, go to Palo Alto. September, I'll be there. I have a concern about the, I'm just going to bring this up here because we've talked about it before, how we communicate, how POCAT communicates with the community and how we get feedback into what needs to happen. And we talked about at one point having some forums where we, we go to the community, have them come in and say, you know, we'd really like to see this and what about that? And, you know, get yelled at a little bit and, and try to smooth out the rough edges and, and then bring that back into our work. Because we don't really have, we have individual connections to the community right now, but we don't have an, a POCAT community connection. So we need to work on that, I think, within the committee. but. I think that if you had a concrete work plan where you, you were looking to answer a certain question, I might feel comfort with you doing community engagement around the question. 
I've I've gone back and forth with Mr. Hansen on this a little bit because in some ways I feel an elected commission is there to make sure we are in touch and understand mm -hmm. what the community is saying. And I, I know that there have been times when um, community members have very much wanted a specific speaker to come here, not to the POCAC, because they want to make sure that the commissioners are hearing. And so that's just there there's a little something to navigate. Um, but if we had a thing where it was you were informing your sediment presentation and and you, you, as part of that plan we're going to take it out to these three different places and include bringing back to us the feedback i mean i think we could do something more structured like that actually in the form of like a public survey or gathering public feedback that you should okay. <laughs> anything else you need from us to feel like today achieved its goal I, um, I'd be interested to to just give a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, would you like us to prepare a work plan with some specific recommendations? Because I think we can do that. Um, and and then either direct that through Camille and Alex or present it to the commission. Mm -hmm. Just some some guidance on on specifically how you'd like us to proceed um, would be helpful. Because again, we. We have a resolution, we follow the resolution, and it says that we get our direction. Yeah. In, until you decide to change that resolution. <laughs> what it says then? Um, well, um, is there any objection from any of the commissioners that we uh, um, follow what Mr. Hansen's recommendation or suggestion? Oh, I invite it. I encourage the, the yeah to be able to yeah. hear back from the POCAC priorities and, and a work plan and what you see. I think that would be uh, excellent. Glad to hear it. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Are they going to stay for agenda setting and they can come up with community um, conversation? Uh, oh, if everybody's problem. okay with it, we're going to. I appreciate all of you guys coming today. It's really important to engage with you. We do continue to engage. We'd love to hear feedback and email. Call it. Um, I'm going to ask for a five minute recess. Uh, <laughs> Mention that. Yeah. Well done, Mr. Chair. Oh, my. Yes.
Thank you, guys. Please fill me with conversation. I know we'll be talking. Okay. Thanks, Harry. And thank you, Joel. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. We are going to have a special meeting on Tuesday and we'll get to work for you. So expect to hear back from us soon. I think it was awesome to have you guys here today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Joel. Bye bye. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Go. Everybody go. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's their all in the back. Yeah, Jasper. Yeah, All right. Learning about PDC Well, I'm going to bring this up during this sort of portion of the oh, meeting. Uh, cool. Yeah, I, uh, there may be an opportunity there. Take advantage of it. And I actually just read an article about that it is develop something that um, turns estuaries into to energy generating yeah. facilities. So some kind of a membrane, and it's really exciting. The non salt water meets the salt water. Hmm. Something, some kind of osmosis. Oh, yeah. Some kind so of like, the Here energy, we go. We're going to be pulling that energy out. out. Yeah. yeah. So really watch out. We're going to be like, Energy producing estuary restoration. Oh, some kind of membrane. <laughs> okay, shall we uh, get started? Uh, get Thank back you. to it? Yes. So, for the agenda setting discussion, you guys going to kick this part off? Sure. I think the thought was um, a couple things was just trying to figure out a way to facilitate. Um, you all being able to talk openly as a five member submission about what you wanted to see on upcoming agendas, you know, what the priorities are for you. So um, there's a couple of ideas um, that uh, one is to try to structure uh, a segment of the 530 meeting um, that would sort of encourage you guys to uh, talk about this um, during like the uh, what is it? Other business, I think, section of the agenda. An alternative is apparently what was done previously, and that is once a month, just have a separate, it would be like a short work session, a one hour meeting where you all get together and talk about the agenda. And those are the two ideas I've heard. Happy to do whatever would work for you all, but I think the goal was just to give all of you an opportunity to weigh in. And, um, so. Um. Yeah, so maybe uh, maybe we could just kind of briefly go over this and sure. where where we're at right now, and and then if uh, um, we have comments, questions, or requests from any commissioners, I like I, you know we talked earlier about um, a few months ago about incorporating this into our our uh, regular commission meetings, and I. I I don't think maybe I haven't done a very good job of trying to get that uh, get that topic brought up so everybody has an opportunity to for input. So um, this is where we can kind of decide how how we approach that. Yeah, we want to go over this just a little bit. Before we dive in, can we just one thing I think that happens at the normal meeting, like not the work session, is we're tired. Yeah, like we're that that place where we're planning to do it. That's not a place for thinking and communication yeah. and well, so, decide where where that place is yeah 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 i think they, they did it like um on a one monday afternoon or something um a month and it was just dedicated solely to looking at the agenda mm -hmm. and setting um agendas for coming meetings. and it doesn't even have to be in person we did it um, remotely yeah, yeah for okay. previously so. um how would that impact staff Oh. Um, I don't think it's any different because um, we keep the Trello board as sort of a running thing. And yeah, I think yeah. happy to 
we schedule a one hour thing. Unless Missy's back there, she could complain. <laughs> helping. Just having like one more meeting a month. I, personally, I would prefer to do it on Teams because for whatever reason, Teams works better. Well, but yep. we need to get her a hat with a flag on it. <laughs> we know she's back there. Missy is in. So we have yes. the ability to, yes. to do a public meeting on Teams. Yep. Like mm -hmm. we did uh, during the pandemic. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Or we could do it. Maybe you have to be a Zoom webinar. But anyway, well, we do it. Teams so personally, like a Teams could join the. Yeah, a team, team, team. Teams could broadcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Teams will work. Other ports use Teams. Um, publicly accessible. Might be new to somebody, but um, it's. And then, Commissioner Isle, in terms of starting with this, what I don't see is the holding pen. So what? Happen to the holding pen of ideas? Are they unhealth? They're all out here. No, they're, they they're, still exist. They're there. Um, we we removed it so that it would be uh, clean, a little cleaner to get through this because it, it was starting. It's getting so long that it was starting to take over the page. There's and maybe a, another page. I think it needs to be. Pen? Yeah, I think it needs to be a separate a separate document so you can see that because I think we do need it for oh, this meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. We have um. Essentially, what we've been doing is uh, there's an annual work plan that we put together, and that's like um, I would think of that as the top of the waterfall, and all and those topics fall into um, the future agendas and get and get pushed into the different uh, meetings throughout the year. For example, I'll just pick on budget, right? Because budget's an, an easy, predictable, uh, cyclical topic. So you'll see where we start. At certain uh, certain months, we start to brief on the budget, and then you'll see. Then we have okay. Then this net this this next month. Now you're starting to um, now you're starting to make decisions on the capital budget, and now there's the full. That's an example um, of just things that are some things that are happening throughout the year. Uh, ideally, you'll see an annual uh, as part of that annual work plan comprehensive um, scheme of harbor improvements will show up and that's updated annually. So there's uh, a number of cyclical things that could fall, that will fall on that. Um, it would be helpful um, at this point too to find out if you want on the future topics, if you want the cyclical things or um, things that fall out of um, you know the cycle, things that happen annually. Because um, right now I think we have a little of both. We have cyclical things on there that, that have shown up on that, and then some some topical things. Yeah, we want both. Okay, very good. Well, it sounds like we're going to be adding the POCAC into that. Yeah, absolutely. Well. The cyclical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Do you? Want to bring up a copy of what's in the holding pen, or are we just do we feel like that was not necessary to look at today? For well, today is is mostly about how how we do five, it. Yeah, how okay. all five commissioners are able to. Yeah, that was the share my thought. What we would like to see yeah, on the agendas. We both are doing that. That be a one. Meeting for an hour on Teams, or like you said, it's not feasible to do it and it will end up in regular commission meetings because it would be under their business. And so, just how we commission add to the agenda. I would like to see it as a 30 minute meeting at the work session, you know, whenever we do the work session. But if that's not how it, there's one open for better. Good idea too. Just add an additional group. Or just, you know, support session. That way it's not an additional meeting. Yeah, and work sessions are less, ex they're, they're, exa they're not exhausting in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can keep this going till six or just three. Okay. okay. I would support that. Do that. Okay. That'd be a standing. So we could be in person. Agenda item for the session. Does that work for you, Commissioner Isle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do, you, do we want to then go through 
that's now about what's coming up. Um, well, I think Commissioner Basavid has got a good point. It, I think what, the whole what, this would be my suggestion for now uh, would be um, to hear from commissioners if they have any suggestions for upcoming topics. I happen to have one. So All right. I, <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> so, okay, um, let's but, do it. you know, not, uh, um, you know, this is our first time actually talking about this. So we don't, I, I, if, unless anybody wants to, we don't really need to get too deep into the woods, but okay. um, I just hear it, hearing input from, uh, from all the commissioners, I think is important. Okay. And I don't have to go first. But you can this time. <laughs> Break the ice. Break the ice. <laughs> All right. Well, one thing that so one I was going to mention that uh, in August, the August twelfth meeting, we're having the Timberland Regional Library Workforce Development and Program Updates. Um, I just kind of I, I want to point out that I think that is a, a great uh, uh, Timberland Regional Li Library is doing great work and they've got great programs, um, and it, I, it's going to be interesting for the commission to. Uh, uh, to hear what's going on there. And, but I think there's some opportunities that the port can take advantage of. It's not necessarily a commission directive, but uh, something that operations base may want to yeah. consider. Um, another topic that I would like to propose for, and there's no hurry on this, but uh, uh, Puget Sound Clean, uh, Puget Sound Energies, clean energy transition um, period. You know, they've been mandated to uh, uh, reach net zero carbon emissions for natural gas, for example, by 2045. And um, let's see, their electric and gas operations, um, supply operations to be net zero by 2030. So they they are working on some plans and some you know looking for opportunities on how that's how this can be accomplished, and one of the things is um, what they're calling battery farms. So they're talking about building like containers that house batteries that you can actually store power because what part of the problem is transmission getting the power to the source. And if that is cut off, then you know how do how do you deal with the interim and and, uh, and that sort of thing. So um, they would like to talk to the port about um, that opportunity uh, for some of our facilities, um, you know, like the airport, for example, or the peninsula, for example. There's they, a they want to talk to us about local energy resilience. Is that what you just said? Sure. That's what I just said, <laughs> uh, but it uh, uh, it's not only energy resilience, but it's also uh, an opportunity. It could be an opportunity for economic development right. and, and revenue generating. Yeah. And it may be an ex more acceptable use of land than, for example, a distribution center. Oh, interesting. So, uh, so you're thinking a work session, having them come in and talk about it, or, or yeah, either I, I think either or, or just or coming to a commission meeting. Just coming to a commission okay. meeting, yeah. Just uh, it does look like there's time on July 15th if they're available. Um, oh. I don't know that they could turn that around that quickly. Um, I would I would prefer to look at maybe fall. <clears throat> oh, I see. Yeah. It's longer term. Yeah. I have something I'd like to raise. Um, I think that we, I appreciated, Alex, uh, Director, your update about um, the air show. And I hope it was successful. I, so, so, Commissioner Tong, I hear you were able to give some opening remarks. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love, and I would love to see us um, follow up within the realm of this time to have that follow up conversation about kind of. And I wanted to figure out together, is that something we see having at the commission level, a meeting, or is there a different venue for it? Um, well, we'll 
say um, I was going to follow up on your thought that we discussed during our one on one about doing sort of an after action with all the various groups the Black House Audubon Society, Fish and Wildlife, the museum, our folks, um, to kind of talk through how it all went and their thoughts about future. And so what additional conversation? Do you see doing that in a forum that's like a publicly noticed forum and therefore it's like, this is what we're doing as a government? Or do you see that as something you convene kind of privately and come yeah. back? And I, it's an open question. Right. question. I, I, I thought, want it to be understood by the public that we're gonna do that. Yeah, and, and I was thinking more of a private conversation just because people tend to be a little more frank if it's not something that's being videoed. Um, but I uh, definitely wanted to make people aware that we were having a conversation. Um, but it, we could also have it be more of that sort of open forum. Yeah. Well, I would just like to request that the commission be fully briefed on what what the process is and what the message is before, before we take it public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to hear the feedback from that stakeholder group, or really all the stakeholder groups um, related to the air show and how moving it next year may affect them and just try to get a greater sense of what impacts it will have on each group and planes needing to be rescheduled and the flight museum themselves um, and then of course the environmental side as well. And I think that will come with the environmental survey support next year too as well. And in that case, do you think in your director's update, maybe next Monday, you could just tell us your next steps for that? We wouldn't have expected it to be scheduled yet, but kind of more the greater detail. And then um, hold a place for you to come back. Ideally, when you come back, we can hold a space that's maybe even more than you to sort of have a report out of the conversation. I would like us to be really headstrong with the because this is a huge public impact issue. And I've already heard from Black Hills Audubon Society and there was a Save the Air show group there. So I think if we try to avoid the public, it's gonna come back around eventually. Start with keeping them informed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe that could be in the holding pit and, and the sort of yeah. turn. Right, on that. My point, Jeffrey. What did you say? Oh, you took my point. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. I just have the issue on the mind. Commissioner Sanders, any anything else you would like to? No, I'm good. <laughs> All right. I'm I just excited one. about oh, sure. um, Go right study ahead. media. Yeah. So again, uh, that's right. Yeah. Well, and have I got checks for you to hand out. Oh, Lord. Yeah. You may hand out some Thank giant you. checks for you. So well, that's that exciting. this Friday? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. So yeah, I did want to talk about the public discourse about the air show. So I'm glad you brought that up, Jasmine. And then um, also there's so much land out there at the air port. I wonder where, what we could do with solar panels. It really seems like that's a huge opportunity we're missing out on out there that others are taking advantage of. I don't know if PSE could educate us on that some. Yeah, I think there's fossil species impacts or, as well. Because I, I know we talked oh, about this right. back in the year. And especially, I think the larks need light on a long, uninterrupted space. Right. The prairies, yeah. So, but we could definitely um, ask the question again. Yeah. So we had a, hmm. we had a uh, presentation that's uh, been over a year ago. I can't remember who gave the presentation, but it was uh, about alternative energy options at the airport. Oh, okay. and um, the the presentation they gave kind of it kind of created a microgrid just for the airport and its um, surrounding properties. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, on the microgrid. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Bring them. Microgrid back. Yeah, we'll take a look and maybe we can get sort of an update and if there's any new opportunities now yeah. for that. Right. Anything else? All right, hearing nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.
Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Right. Let me know the submission.